there's ready to party right now. How many victorious people do I have out there? If you're victorious, the party starts right now. Do you believe that?
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Come on in. Whew. Nice and fall-like weather we are having. Good morning, good morning. This, I always mess things up and the sound guys get happy with me. I'll just say it like that. This morning as we gather and people are still coming in, I want us to focus in on the love and the grace of God that God has for all of us and for those who never go to church, who are never a part of a faith community. And that's, that's right, because God loves them. And God loves you exactly where you are in your journey this morning. And as we gather, we focus in on the light and the love of God. And this candle represents the light of Christ that lives within all of us. And especially if we recognize that and live into that. So if you're able, please stand as we intentionally lift our voices to heaven and worship God this morning. Gracious, loving God, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your grace for us. We thank you that you are a God that does not give up on us. Messy, struggling people. That you are a God that walks with us. Right beside us. Within us. So God, as we lift our voices to the sky, as we turn our hearts toward hope this morning, may we receive encouragement and grace. Be with us, Lord, as we open up the scriptures. Be with us, God, as we struggle with doubt and wondering if our prayers even go beyond the ceiling. We love you, Lord. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us worship.
I surrender all. for songs of loudest praise. Let me hear you. Teach me. Teach me some the loudest song is sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Mount of God's unchanging the only one 
Iowa Bill. Part, as we continue in worship, we give of our resources in worship. Uh, sometimes we think, well, I'm going to give some resources, some money, but in that act, that is an act of worship. It's an act of giving. And this church, uh, every church says this every Sunday morning, this church is very unique. Well, we are. Uh, not many churches this morning on their table of grace will have underwear on their table of grace, right? We are collecting socks and underwear for our houseless neighbors. They are not homeless. They are a part of our community. Amen? Okay? They are a part of our community. But they are houseless. And they are in need. And so as you give of resources this morning and your, of your tithes and offerings, also remember that your giving makes a difference in this community in feeding the poor, uplifting those who have been marginalized, not just here, but all throughout the country. And then next week, please bring some underwear, not your underwear that you've worn, 
Hello? Okay. Wake up, people. I've had a Red Bull, so I get the Holy Ghost, all right? But, but bring some underwear, some socks, and then on the 24th, we're going to go out and give them away, which Danielle will tell us more about. Let's pray for the offering. Gracious, loving God, we thank you that we are blessed and we are able to give, able to give to make a difference, to make a difference in people's lives. Take these gifts, some are large, some are small. It does not matter. It is a gift from our hearts to help spread this message of grace. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're going to pass the, the bags there, and there's several different ways to give. Thank you, Phil. Or you can text to give. Wow, times. It's awesome. Or you can go to missiongatheringsd.org and give online. But thank you very much. And let's continue to worship as we sing uh, How Great Thou Art. Is that correct? Here we go.
Good morning, Mission Gathering. So I've been gone a couple weeks, and I noticed that my mic is not where I need it to be. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, good morning. It is my great pleasure to be able to welcome you to Mission Gathering this morning. My name is Danielle. Um, as Pastor Rich mentioned, we are in the middle of uh, collecting socks and underwear. Um, as you can see behind me, growing, but we need more. The goal here is on the 24th to collect as many as we can, spend some time after church, make some sandwiches, get lunches together, and go out into our community and help give grace to those of our houseless friends. If you have not had the opportunity to be a part of this with Mission Gathering, I do encourage you to take this opportunity to do it. One of the greatest moments that I have had in being a member of this church was about eight years ago when we called it um, Be the Church. And we would go out into the community and we would serve lunches. And I am telling you from experience, it is a moment you don't want to miss. Uh, we do really well and do great things with our community by doing this. So we do encourage you to join us on the 24th. But next Sunday, if you could please bring a new bag of underwear or socks and then stay with us on the 24th after church and help make lunches. We would appreciate it. If you are new to Mission Gathering, I do encourage you to pick up a connection card. You can get one right over here. Uh, if you could just fill it out, this gives us an opportunity to get in touch with you and you an opportunity to learn more about the church and new ways of volunteering. There are going to be some volunteer opportunities coming up, so you don't want to miss that. If you're joining us online, welcome to you as well. You can do the same uh, at missiongatheringsd.org. With that said, we will now participate in another wonderful tradition of mission gathering, and that is to pass the peace. If you would stand, say hello to somebody you haven't met, say hi to somebody you have met but haven't seen in a while, and encourage you to shake their hand, give a hug, elbow, wave, whatever you feel comfortable doing. And with that, I say, may the peace be with you. Be life for the shadow go. Focus in here. We started last week uh, a series. Well, before I jump into that, we have a, a really important uh, announcement to make. 
Uh, Nancy Fowler turned 40 years old today. It's awesome. <laughs> Happy birthday, Nancy. <laughs> and I, too, I've uh, turned 35 about a few times, and so it's amazing how that works, uh, especially in SoCal. Uh, happy birthday, my friend. We've known each other for a little while. So, but we started a series that a friend of ours here at Mission Gathering, uh, he's been here a couple times, and uh, actually I give him the credit for Mission Gathering. Um, many years ago, he wrote a book about the new kind of Christian and he's written many books since then and has been a part of this progressive movement of progressive Christianity that's taken place throughout the world in the last 15 to 20 years. Brian McLaren wrote a book, it's his newest book, and it's titled Faith After Doubt. Uh, and so we're doing a series on faith and doubt. And the question is, can faith and doubt coincide? And they coincide. And so this morning, I want to break down um, as much as I can, and then I want us to have some conversation about it. Um, the four stages of faith. There's probably many other stages, but we're going to look at four stages of faith this week and next week. And look at what it means to be in one of these stages, or maybe some of you are actually in a couple of these stages. But we are a church that embraces questions. We are a church that believes if you don't believe, that's okay. All right? We are a church that over the years, non religious people have been a part of. Atheists have been a part of. We are a church that no matter where you are in your faith journey or a journey of just being in community, you are completely, completely welcomed here. Those of you that are watching by uh, social media platforms, the same is for all of you. That no matter where you are in your spiritual plateau uh, or, or a stage or what have you, you are welcomed here. This is your home as well. You don't have to think like me. I mean, you might be more creative if you did. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. All right. I'm trying to wake you up here. Or you might be full of ink. Well, anyway, all right, stop, Rich. Okay. But you don't have to believe like the pastor. You don't have to believe like the leaders. You don't have to think like us, dress like us, wear any special t-shirts like anyone else. You don't have to do any of that. What I do encourage you, though, to do is to have an open mind. Every time I preach, wherever I go, or just do a workshop, or just hanging out with friends, and when we get into, into the conversation of spirituality, of faith, God, you know, if you want to have an interesting evening, right, you, you have a few beers, not that I encourage that, right, but you maybe have a few drinks, and then God comes up. You're like, why? Why are we talking about God? Well, normally when you start drinking, you talk about something heavy like that. And then I'm with friends, and we're having a good time, having some good food, some good wine, and God comes up. And my mind and who I am as a person of faith I never go, oh, man, I don't want to talk about God. Not because I'm always excited because I'm Pastor Rich. That's not what I'm saying. But when God shows up in a conversation with some friends, I believe God pulls up a chair and goes, hey, I'm right here. I'm right here. My first miracle was making wine. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> right? Let's all just relax and go ahead and talk about me as if I'm not here, but I'm always here, right? And so when, one, when some of my friends say, well, I'm not a believer. I don't believe. I'm, I'm, I can't believe in this higher power. I'm always like, that's cool, but God believes in you. And then I all, now, you used to, they used to that, was so, that was kind of like edgy to say that, right? Now... They kind of roll their eyes, like, Rich, you've said that to me a million times. So they're like, okay, listen, 
You may not believe that God believes in you, that God created you and God loves you and God is on this journey with you because you've experienced a lot of trauma. You've experienced some pain. You may just feel like scientifically you cannot land at that place. That's okay. But just know I believe in you. I believe that God created you. I believe that God has a purpose for you. And having those conversations, and that's the type of mindset I want you to have this morning. Have an open mind. Some of you are here because you heard through Instagram or some, some other platform that we are talking about faith and doubt and how to work through those things. If you go through this series and end up at a place where, where you're like, I don't even know what I actually believe now. That dude, Rich McCullen, and that church mission gathering confused me even more. Hang in there with us. Don't give up. Just like God doesn't give up on us, on you, on me, thank you God for not giving up on this messy person. Don't give up so easily. All right. That's a good intro, Pastor Rich. Well, thank you. I want to talk about the four stages of faith, but let's dive into the first three. First three. Simplicity. Woo! We love that, don't we? Things are simple. Faith before doubt is about a correct belief. See if you've been there. Maybe you're there now. A correct belief, a theology, creeds, and principles, right? My dad would always say, it's the principle of the matter, right? And he wasn't Italian, right? The creeds and principles, right and wrong, right? We live in a world, right and wrong, good and evil. Stephen King, one of the greatest authors of modern times, and you guys ever read it? Some of the Stephen King books? One of my favorite. I love Stephen King. You're a pastor. I know. I love Stephen King. My favorite holiday is what? Halloween. I love it, love it, love it. All right? So, good and evil. And uh, uh, he was being interviewed. And I said, Stephen King, what is your secret? Your books are dark, your books are scary. But you sell millions upon millions of books. What is your secret? You know what he said? He said, I never confuse good and evil. There's always good and there's always evil, right? And you think about that. Well, that's, that's, pretty, uh, that's a simple way of looking at it. And that's what he does. And he sells millions upon millions of books, and the stories are amazing. But good and evil. We live in a world where you can be good if you think like me, if you look like me, if you vote like me, you're good. If you don't, ooh, you might just be a bad person. Right? We live in that world. Very polarizing at times. But good and evil. We need to have good and evil. At times, life is a war. We have a battle to fight. We have a crusade to lead in, to be a part of. And we need authority figures who have claim, who have a claim on the ultimate truth. I've said this for years since I've started Mission Gathering and other Mission Gathering churches. If any pastor stands up here or any other church that you may attend and communicates that we or he or she has the corner on all truth when it comes to God, you should get up and walk out immediately. That's a scary place to be. It leads to a lot of unhealthy patterns and unhealthy communities of faith. As soon as someone says, I know all the truth, and you need to do what I say, and you need to think the way I think, because then you will be happy. You will know more life and be more fulfilled. You should be cautious of that way of thinking, right? Okay, normally I get an amen out of progressives on that one, but nothing yet. All right, I'll hold on. I'll hold on. In simplicity, faith expresses itself in its beliefs, in its theology, 
and its creeds, okay? In this simplicity, Christian world, world of belief, faith is about this um, document statement, this theology statement, this mission statement of what we believe and what we do, how we do faith, and I hope you join because we got it all figured out, or at least we've got a lot of things figured out, and you should join us because we're actually really good. Faith expresses itself in belief. We see people in this, the, this stage of simplicity in all spectrums of Christianity, be it conservative immediately, because I know who I'm preaching to, you're immediately thinking the conservatives, the conservatives, the conservatives. No. Progressives do all of this also. Progressives see, well, that, well, you know, you have a, you are very close-minded. And so we don't say it out loud, but well, that's just, that's kind of like evil, right? We can be judgmental. Progressive Christianities, we're, Christians are supposed to be open-minded, but a lot of times we're not. So one of the stages, more like the first stage of spirituality, Christian spirituality, is that we like simplicity. We like it simple. I said to you last week, when I was young, nine years old, I needed Jesus to be this Jesus that would ride in on a white horse and save me. I needed this Jesus to be this conquering war hero. Okay? I was abused as a kid. I lived amongst alcoholics and drug addicts. So I needed this Jesus that would swift me up and take me to a church down the street and give me safety and security. That's what I needed at that time. But things change. You grow up. You, you, you experience more life and you start to question things. And as soon as I started questioning things, that safe, loving, wonderful church on, with a steeple, white church, just like in a movie scene, Beautiful, wonderful, cooking fried chicken every Sunday. Everybody loved each other. Everything was good until you go, ah, but, ah, gee, I don't know. I don't know if I believe like that. <laughs> I don't think you are really, I don't know if you're really saved. What? I've known you for years. You basically raised me. Well, you have an attraction to the same sex. Well, yeah, I'm working through it. Ugh. That's weirding us out. You're living in sin. In fact, you might have a demon. Woo! I'm like, well, if a demon can help me dress better than you, hmm, I might, I might go for that. I might do that. There, I got an amen. All right. Can't wait for the emails. All right. Simplicity. So we like it simple. We like it you know, white or black, good and evil, when it gets a little messy or a little weird or a little um, uh, confusing even and questionable, we struggle with it. We do that beyond faith and religion. And then the stage two, complexity. Complexity. That's something that happened to me and happens to a lot of you. You're in that space right now. We become a little bit more independent trying to work out those beliefs and the theology and creeds and principles and how we live and how we practice life. Faith expresses itself in action, in doing, and perfecting those beliefs. The complexity of that. Not a bad thing. Simplicity is not a bad thing. Complexity is not a bad thing. Here's a great example. Right here, I very rarely touch women's underwear, but I am today, all right? Right? We're challenged in our complexity of like, okay, we see houseless individuals. For various reasons, they are houseless. And we know one of the top requests that when you ask a, a houseless person, what do you need? They may be holding a sandwich. They may not. They may have not have eaten for a couple of days, but they always say, I need two things. I need underwear and I need socks. And so as a church, as a church that's rebuilding itself and growing again, realigning them, it, itself with its mission and its purpose, which mission gathering is, 
we see those needs and in this we want to practice the need we want to practice the theology and the creed that we are called to help the poor we are called to help our houseless neighbors right and so we go hey Let's collect underwear and socks and let's make sandwiches and let's go in the neighborhood and make a difference. That is perfectly fine. That is wonderful. Right? Hello? It is. It's great. But it goes beyond that because it has to be more than just a good feeling. It has to be more than, well, I ha I'm doing this because Jesus told me to do this. I'm doing this because if I don't show up, I'm still holding these underwear. If I don't do this, if I don't do that, they're going to be disappointed in me. Now, I don't want people at the church to be disappointed. I don't want my friends to be disappointed. And so creed and practice of faith and theology is not necessarily, necessarily freeing us, but it actually becomes controlling us. Ooh, that's good. Tweet that one, right? But we become independent. But we know we want to express our faith and our spirituality. So it's complex because we start asking questions. And that's what happened to me. I start asking questions, theologically. How am I, how am I going to handle this in my life? I love God. I know God loves me. I love God with all my heart. I know God loves me, but I'm thinking different. Things are changing. But I really want to help the poor. And I really want to live into what God wants us to live into. So complexity. A lot of us are in that stage. And then there's perplexity. Perplexity. Pol being pol uh, per all right, I'll get it in a second. My brain's is overloaded on Red Bull. Perplexed. Faith expressed itself in, in doubt and questioning all that we've been taught. Dun, 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 dun. This is where a lot of us are today. This is where a lot of people are all throughout the world. Perplexity is where so many people who are known as evangelicals, especially the evangelicals in their 30s and 20s, right? They are in a very unique situation because they are starting to question, not just question, not just in the complexity of things, but now it's becoming a little, it's becoming a little strange because they're, they're, they're starting to doubt what the pastor is saying. They're starting to doubt what they're reading in the Bible. It's perplexed. It's complicated. And then they start voicing those things at small group. You ever been in one of those small groups? You ever been in that smart, small group? You ever been in that leadership meeting? You go, whoa, I don't know. I think that song talks about everybody going to hell. I don't know if I really believe in hell right now. What? You don't believe in hell? Well, where does bad people go? I don't know. I think there's a lot of bad people in this room. I've literally said that before. I think there's a lot of bad people in this room. I know what you guys do on Friday and Saturday. Okay? Right? You start asking and you start doubting. I don't know if I believe like that anymore. And then you get to worry about, are you going to go to hell? Right? You're going to go to hell? I don't really believe in that that this thing that I grew up in or this thing that my parents put on me, I don't know if I live and think like that anymore. And so therefore, what does my eternity look like? These are very serious questions. It becomes per perplexity. So I want to talk about, I want to kind of show you a good story here in Mark. We keep staying in the book of Mark, which I love. Wasn't planning on it. Mark 10. A person who lived in simplicity, complexity, and he had it figured out. But Jesus challenges that. Uh, Mark 10, 17 through 31. A lot of us know this as the rich young ruler, very successful young guy in Jesus' time. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Obviously, he had a lot of respect for Jesus. 
a lot of love for Jesus, heard great things about Jesus. Obviously, he attended synagogue. He was religious because he went immediately and called him what? Good teacher. Good teacher. Not just teacher, right? You got a good professor. You're like, you are an awesome professor. You're not going to get an A on that. Okay, all right, I'm just going to try it. But he goes, good teacher. And he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, at this time, in this context, when a Jewish person would say eternal life, they didn't mean, I'll fly away by that. You know, I'm going to go to heaven. That's not what they were talking about. The golden streets and the big mansions, that's not what they believed, right? Eternal life is how can I have a more fulfilled purpose in life? How can I know what it means to be a person with purpose and love of God and for my neighbors? That's what it meant. And then Jesus immediately goes and does what Jesus does so well. He challenges the man and his statement. Uh, okay, hi, nice to meet you. My name is Jesus, right? Why do you call me good? What is your motives right now? What is your belief system? And why am I good? Because no one is good except God alone. Now you're getting a little trippy because it's getting a little trippy. Maybe not you, you're not. You aren't. I do when I read this because I know Jesus was good. You know Jesus was good. I hope. Maybe you don't. Jesus was good. Later, he talks about being the Messiah. But Jesus is saying here, why are you calling me good? Oh, wait a minute. That is your religious practice. I'm a teacher. I'm a rabbi to you, so therefore I'm good. Really? How do you know that I'm good? How do you know my heart? What's your heart like? Let's go deeper, Jesus says. Let's go to the next verse. You know the commandments. Obviously, you fell on your knees. You think I'm a good teacher, a good rabbi. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not de defraud. Honor your father and mother. All right, so real quick, for you, don't stay with this scripture here. So when you read this, this is what, this is a religious practice. This is a, this is their theology. This is their simplicity right and wrong. This is what you do, right? This is what you do because you are a religious person. You want to be better and you want to give better life and, and live in purpose and you want to help people. You don't want to murder someone when they piss you off. That's a good thing not to do. You don't want to commit adultery. That's not your partner. You don't take someone that's, you know, and, and do something that uh, break up their relationship, their commitment. You don't want to steal from someone who's worked hard for what they have. You're right. You don't want to give false testimony. You don't want to gossip about people and make up stuff about people. You don't want to defraud your place of work. And you want to honor your parents who have invested so much in you. That all is really good. That's a good way to live. That's a really cool way to live. Right? Hello? This also can be very controlling. This can be life, or this can be death. Let me give you a personal example. My father would say, you are supposed to obey me. You are supposed to do and act and think like I tell you because your Bible, he wasn't religious, your Bible says you are to honor your father. My father was evil. My father did bad things to, to my mother, to my brothers. We spent most of our time in the hospitals because of this man. And so when I would say something, I would challenge him. You don't treat someone like this. You don't do the things you're doing. He would say, hey, boy, you're to honor me. Everything I do is okay. We've had ministers say that. They would say this. I'm, the, I'm, I'm a person of God. God has what? Ordained me. See? And I've heard about being ordained. I'm ordained. By, this, by my, de my denomination, 
but it doesn't mean I'm right. And what my dad was right all the time, it doesn't mean my dad was right. There's times he was a, he understood life. He had, he, had, he had experience. He would say something wise now and then. But to control, to use these things to control is death. So you have a creed, you have a religion, you have a faith system. It is simple. But when you start challenging, mm, I get it, you want me to honor you, but you are really screwed up. Hello? Stay with me. Stay with me. Dad, you, Mom, you make a lot of mistakes. There's things you need to work on. So it's a faith system, but it doesn't mean, does not mean you can't look at the heart of what? This faith system. These principles. The simplicity of this has got to get a little deeper than that. All right. Someone give me an amen. Help me out. All right. Okay. So the next verse. Teacher. <laughs> I'm not going to say good teacher this time, obviously. That, that rubs you the wrong way. Teacher, he declared. All of these I've kept since I was a boy. I mean, I have a great family. I grew up in a good home. And I'm pretty wealthy, educated. I'm a part of society, pretty invested in the local community. I'm, I'm a good guy. I've been a part of the synagogue my whole life. I even thought of becoming a rabbi, and then I realized you guys don't make a lot of money, so I didn't. But I give a lot to the church, to the synagogue. I'm very invested. I've done all of these things. This is very, very important. My faith, my, my gatherings, my community, I, my family. I love all of them. This is very, very important. Teacher, I'm a good dude. Yes, I, of course, I do all of this. And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Oh, I get emotional when I read that. Because we see, at least I do, it jumps out at me every time I read this story. That Jesus looked at this man's heart. And no matter what, no matter if he didn't do any of these things, no matter if he was a bad person in society and caused a lot of problems, no matter if he murdered someone, and we read in the Gospels where Jesus showed the same thing, Jesus loved. This morning, you could have done the opposite of that faith system that we just read that's been passed down thousands of years. You could have been the opposite of all of those things, or you could have done all those things, and now you feel empty because they didn't really do anything to your heart. They were just rules to you. No matter where you are in your faith system, no matter where you are with no faith system, you are loved. You are loved. And this is where we've lost. You can go, go back to the scriptures, the first scripture that we read. If you try to practice this without love, it fails every time. Because then it, become, it becomes a way where someone is controlling you or you are controlling someone for your agenda. I wasn't planning on saying that, but there you go. Jesus looked at him and, says, and he loved him. He loved him. And he knew that he was about to take him from, from simplicity to from complexity. I've done all that. I'm a good person. I work hard at those things. Even when my friends challenge me not to give so much to synagogue, I do it. The complexity. I've worked out my religion. I've worked out my creed. This is what it is. Jesus goes, okay, cool. That's a good thing. I love you. You got it together, man. I like that. You lack one thing, though. One more thing. Oh, what's that? Gets out his little pen. Maybe a, a ch all right, forget it. He starts writing down. <laughs> you lack one thing, he said. Go sell everything you have. Give to the poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. Heaven, again, is not this far, far place. Heaven is within them. You will know more. You will have purpose. You have direction. Those things, those creeds, those, that religion, all of those things, that job, your status, all of those things, give it away. Give it all away and invest in the lives of people who you probably don't really care for too much. He went to the heart, the heart, and then he said, then come follow me. So it went from simplicity and then complexity, I do all of those things, to being very perplexed. 
faith expressed in doubt and questioning all that we've been taught. Jesus says, oh, those are okay. Those are good things. I appreciate that you're doing that, but you need to go deeper and go ahead and let those things push aside a little bit. You need to go deeper and rest in the fact that, hey, I now have to give it away and it's okay to think twice about it and do something to make a difference in my community and people who need me right now to come through for them. Then you will know what it means to have heaven here on earth. So it got complex. So what happens? Let's look at the next scripture. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. A great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were amazed at his words. This is what's happening in North America. And this is what's happened in Europe over the years. Faith rules a solid simplicity of good and evil. God is good and people who disobey or, dis or disagree can be evil. That simplicity, us working through that, the complexity of how we're going to practice this, how we're going to do that, we're going to build all these churches, we're going to do all these things in the name of God, all of these things. And then Jesus goes, it's not about how big the church is, it's not about how great the pastor is, it's not about all these things, it's not about how much you don't lie, how you don't cheat, how you don't steal, how you don't do all these things. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about love. It's about love and giving yourself to others. It's about being invested not only in the fact that things that you want, but to be invested in things that make you more like Jesus. And that's very difficult to do, very difficult to do. And to do that, a lot of you need to walk away from religion and find Jesus. Jesus beyond religion. I need an amen on that one. And then he challenges the people, hey, you've got a lot of things, you have a lot of principles, you have a lot of wealth, it's going to be very difficult for you to see. And it's very difficult for America to hear this right now. It's very difficult for America to hear this because we would rather, I'm going to go, I'm challenging here, we'd rather walk away from communities of faith that challenges us. It's okay to doubt, it's okay not to believe. But promise you, we promise you, you will come out on the other side and you will have a deeper, richer, more fulfilling faith. We promise you. It's okay. Push away all these systems. Push away that hate that you felt because you came out of the closet. Push away all of that rejection because you're straight and you started questioning, wait a minute, I don't know if I believe in hell. I don't know if I believe my friend who's gay is going to hell. I'm questioning everything. Mom, dad, I won't see you at Thanksgiving because I can't bring my friend who needs a place to go. Right? You know what I'm saying? All those things, all simplicity, complexity is good, but if you cannot practice it and live into it and you just can't do it, a lot of people are doing this and some of you are struggling with this and some of you that are watching me right now on Facebook, you're struggling with this, what you've done because you felt this rejection, you felt this anger, you've seen the church go crazy. January 6th is a great example, the insurrection. It's people who see evil, and they have to conquer the evil, and they're going to break the law. They're going to go against things because they see the evil of people who think a little wider, a little deeper, a little more open. They're afraid of that, right? Stay with me. So there's this evil, and so therefore you're going, I can't be a part of this. And evangelicals, they've got behind this, and they're supporting this. And we found out most of the people there go to church. They're evangelicals. They march against the Capitol. Uh, to the capital and marched against the government that elected who they did, a country who elected who they did. Stay with me. You with me? Hello? Okay. I know this is, this is tough. This is deep. But, and so a lot of you are going, a lot of you are going, I want nothing to do with that. I'm getting the hell out of this. I don't even believe in hell anymore. I'm getting out of this. This is crazy. These faith people are nuts and you have completely walked away. I am challenging you to allow yourself to live in that doubt, to live in that space, live in that tension, because I promise you, Jesus wants you, just like he did to this man, challenged him. Jesus wants you to live in that tension. Jesus wants you to live in that complexity, that perplexity. Why is that? And this is what happened in my life, because then your faith becomes yours. Then your faith becomes yours. 
but it may not look what, I, what I'm comfortable with. It won't. It will not. But, but, but my parents might be disappointed, maybe, but you're going to be happier and healthier, and I trust me, if they're good parents, they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. I may lose friends. I lost friends when I literally said, and I literally said, we're all against abortion. I know I'm going there today. We're all against abortion, right? But I support a woman's right to choose. No, not, no one is for this. But we know there's circumstances. We know I went there. Why did you go there, Rich? I don't know. I know some board members are going, why did you go there? I don't know. You signed the check already. I'm in. So anyway. <laughs> but we know a woman has a right to choose. At least we should. And I'm with Christians, conservative Christians, even liberal Christians. I'm like, nah, no. I, 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 no one supports that. But a woman, it's her body. She should have that choice. Instead of us just complaining about it and talking down on people, why don't we invest millions of dollars, not beautiful, bigger churches, why don't we invest millions of dollars of homes for these moms that don't have options? Why don't we invest millions of dollars into education that empowers these moms to have jobs, to raise their kids? Why don't we give people hope instead of just damning them? And when you do that, when you challenge that, that gets very complicated, and so therefore, that's not simple. That's not simplicity. You need to move on. Amen. And what's happened is a lot of people have moved on. And Jesus doesn't want you to just move on and walk away. Jesus wants you to know that even in your doubts and your, pl your perplexities, you, you are in this space of doubt, but you are loved. You are loved. That's some good stuff. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about this. I, I'll uh, jump into stage four next week, and that's harmony. But let's talk about this. Simplicity, complexity, and perplexity. Let's talk about that. So I'm going to make you a little uncomfortable, if I haven't already. A little, little uncomfortable. I just got some eyes. I want you to kind of like turn some chairs, face someone, look someone in the eyes. I know you're like, oh, but it's not Facebook. It's not a screen, yeah? I got to talk to someone. Yes, I know, it's so crazy. All right, and then we're gonna, I'm going to give you like two questions just to talk to someone and connect. If you do that, uh, you guys over there, right there, you can come right here. Over there, Terry can join, Phil, John, you guys right here. If you guys can come over here, right there, and all of you right here. Is that okay? I'm not trying to control you. <laughs> I'm not trying to control you. If you don't want to say anything, just go, pass, right? Don't freak out. I know this is, but I want to challenge us to say things out loud of what you just heard. So go ahead and do that real quick, and I've got some questions that we can discuss. If you would introduce yourselves real quick, your name, all you gotta do is just tell them your name real quick. Everybody introduce yourselves? All right. Okay. Where are my questions? Here they are. I know they're here somewhere. And what stage, the one, two, and three, what stage, where do you see yourself right now? And what stage, simplicity, complexity, or perplexity? What stage of faith do you see yourself at right now? We have some little bit of music, not too loud though. And we're going to, go ahead and answer it, go for it.
be sure to try to let everyone in the group answer that question.
Okay. Let's come back for a few minutes here as we go into communion. You can carry, you can continue these conversations afterwards. Isn't that cool to actually talk to like strangers? You don't know, just uh, beyond a screen. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so in Brian's book, he, he writes, he puts this, let me, uh, John, we're going to go with the, the Brian McLaren quote, uh, offers a story in his book of a conversation. And he goes, he says this, I used, this is him talking to a, a conversation uh, with a friend. He's having a conversation with a friend, and there's a lot of doubt in this conversation. I used to think that if I didn't have answers, I would only be left with questions. But now I'm starting to realize that if I live into the questions, if I live into the questions, if I don't have to fix or solve every problem, then I can welcome all the unknowns, all the unknowns with wonder and innocence. I don't know what to call it, a kind of a meditative awareness, maybe, or even, or even reverence, or even reverence. He goes on to say this, in the midst of all my questions, I keep Finding gratitude, wow. Right, gratitude and wonder and joy. And this feeling of companionship and freedom. I'm less sure of what God is and more sure of whatever God is. God is with me in all of this. God is with you in all of this. And then he goes on to say, that's not such a bad thing. And I agree with Brian. Living in a world of wonders rather than a world of answers, it's actually very, very good. Again, every week as a community of faith, we come to this, this table and this table represents a God that believes in us, a God who does not give up on us, no matter where we are on our faith journey. And with his closest friends, the room that was full of doubt, confusion, people who met this man by the name of Jesus, this, this carpenter, right? grew and became a leader and gave these people, Peter and John and Mary, all of them, a answer, and they lived in the simplicity of that. And in the complexity of working that out with each other, sharing this message of a new kingdom, a new expression, fighting against the evils of empire and Religion, controlling religion. But now they sit in a room full of perplexity. Where Jesus says, this is my body. This is God's body and it will be broken for all. All who doubt. All who don't believe. And all who do. This will be broken for the Judases, for the people who have done all the right things, but yet have their own agenda. And then he took the wine and he poured it into the chalice and he said, this is the love of God. And in the middle of your questioning, in the middle of all your doubts, please know that God's love is greater. God's love will always be there, even when you don't feel it, even when you are feeling you need to push it away. God's love is always there. 
And God's love is here right now. And so if you would take your elements of grace, take that little wafer out, and very soon we're going to go back to the other way of doing communion, more personal connection. If you take that and prepare yourself to take these elements, let's pray. Gracious, loving God, God, I know I say that uh, in a room full of people who, well, who struggle with even believing that you are a loving God. We want to. But God, we're seeing so much hate in your name. We're seeing so much division. So it's hard. And so God, it's led us to a place, so many of us, it's led us to a place of just doubting it all together. God, I'm here. I'm here with other seekers. I'm here with other doubters. And so in this time, in this communion cup, this plastic cup with juice and this wafer that stands for your love, Let me be okay with not having the answers. Let me, help me, God, help us, help all of us, help us to be okay with just not knowing everything, not having all the right answers. Help us to live just in the wonder of love and your creation and that there is good left in this world and it starts with us take and eat and drink and knowing that you are loved
is, a, I've never heard that song. That song is amazing. That's the justice music we've been talking. That is amazing. Uh, if you could, please stand uh, if you're able. So in the challenges of today, and wherever you are in your faith journey, I'm going to take that song as something from God for us today. I'm going to give you a challenge. Be a person of justice today. Right? I mean today. Think of what you can do today to help someone. A creator of justice. Move aside. Well, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to bring my underwear, not your underwear. I'm going to bring a box of underwear next week, Rich. No, no, no. What can you do today well, in your doubt and your frustrations and maybe even today's message? Oh, I didn't come today to hear that stuff. I wanted to hear other things. Whatever. In that, practice love. Practice justice today. Trust me. You, can, you can't walk 10 feet and not have an opportunity not to do that. We are to be the hands and the feet of this God that we doubt a lot, but he does not, she does not doubt you and I. Gracious, loving God, go with us. Go with us in the middle of our doubts and lack of, well, faith. Go with us and may we experience you in the eyes of a stranger today as we did in these groups. May we be your hands and your feet to someone today. May we be people of justice and love. And in that, we live in faith. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Bring somebody next week and do not forget the socks and underwear. I love you guys. See you next week.